Hi, love you too. Awesome. Well, good talk. See you later. Um, next up, we have a guest. Well, he's a guest. And uh, you've seen him all weekend, but surely there are one or two things you haven't been able to ask. You get them all to yourself. That's right. Mr. Richards Fake Jr. The song, song inspired by my fear inspired of by your fear of flying, and we changed the lyric we, to say? be Richard Spate. Oh, I always thought that was This is Richard Spate. It's funny when I sing that song to myself, I just sing it with that. I thought that was part of the lyric. You think every lyric is Richard Spate? Every Richard Spate is Richard Spate. I Richard fell Spade. into a burning Richard Spate. Yeah. Uh, Richard Spate and Richard Richard Spate. Uh, two things to discuss before you guys step off stage. Number one. These are the matching glasses we discussed on Friday. And, uh, for, those, for those of you who want to get a close shot of the matching glasses, they are exactly matching. The, you know you're old when people are screaming, take it off, and they mean your glasses. <laughs> Angry Rich? Okay. Whenever Rob ever takes me, he leans forward and you chews. Suddenly I'm become a, uh, chewing a cud and I have a back problem. That's right. <laughs> it's, the not, it's not far from uh, Jensen Ackerman. I love that he actually did that just now. He did his comedy elbows, not even doing his comedy yeah. elbows. And we pointed out that he did his comedy elbows and he responded by doing comedy elbows. That's right. Yeah. Um, you guys know about Jensen's comedy elbows, right? Yeah. It's his tell. He can't tell a joke without getting that fabric up over the elbow. Um, uh, also, before we, we say goodbye to the band for a brief moment, we're going to say goodbye to some members of the band for a longer moment because two of them have to go catch a plane flight back to their families. So please, a big Dallas thank you to Mr. Michael, birthday boy, Borja. And Mr. Billy, I'm sick of talking about Michael's birthday, Moran. <laughs> Billy Moran! Michael Moran! Take it all. Gentlemen, thank you for a fantastic weekend. Round of applause for these guys, please. Fantastic show this weekend. Get home safely. Everybody will see you in Vancouver. There they go. Have a good panel, buddy. Thank you. There they go. Michael Borja and Billy Moran. Yeah. How's it going, everybody? Good? You have fun? Yeah. Pain will go alright? Yeah? yeah? Jared, come out. Did you? Fall down? Yeah? They're homegrown fellas here, you know. Local boys, as we like to say. They're a great con. And I, I say that, that sounds like a, uh, I said that was a surprise. And I'm sorry if that sounds offensive. I apologize. I'm not surprised. I expect it to be a great con. But we haven't been here in a while. It's been too long. Too long, it's probably, it's probably sure. And so it's nice to come back, and it's nice to be in a town we haven't seen for a while. It's nice to be welcomed so warmly. So thank you for the fantastic uh, reception and weekend. It's been awesome. Um, I, since it's a Q and an A, I can't really serve up the A until I get a Q. So I'll start right here. Hi, Rich. Hey. Um, my question is about Rich and the Volunteers, and yes. um, you have been recording an album, so if you can share anything about that, and also if you're excited about touring. Yeah, listen, I, the, I, I get more excited about the album the more we work on the album. And this is, this whole album that I'm doing, so I'm doing, a, I'm doing an album, and, and the, the band is actually called Dick Jr. and the Volunteers, and that is the musical ensemble we are using as our name as we create the album. Uh, it is an exercise. Uh, this whole thing is a tribute to Jason Mann's power of persuasion. 
because you brought this up to me two years ago, and I said it was a terrible idea, and now I'm recording an album. So I don't know, somewhere between me saying no, and uh, about two months ago, he convinced me. I, I've always loved music. I've always loved playing music, listening to music, being in bands. It's been a hobby of mine since I was a kid. So this is a great opportunity for me. I didn't want to do something. I just, the, the, the hard part for me was finding a way to do it that I felt was honest to what I liked. Because I'm not Gil or Brianna, I'm not, and I, and I think they're both geniuses and super talented people and musicians, and I love both their records. But I'm not that voice, I'm not that guy, I'm not that singer, and I'm not that personality. And so I had to find something, so a way to figure it out. And Jason and I put our heads together and found this sort of, you know, I'm not going to tell you the songs that are on there because things are going to change. If I say something and it changes, then, then I will be called out, and I don't want that to happen. But I'm really happy with the song list we've got going and the recording we're doing. And we've just found a great group of musicians who can fill out the volunteers and create more of a band vibe to the whole thing. Some of the tracks are being done live at one time. First, and they know we might go in and over it a little bit, but we're, we're going in there and we'll, we, we rehearse these songs, we find these songs, we try it, doesn't work, we keep working on it, try to create like a band feel to the whole recording process. And I'm loving that, because that's where I feel comfortable. What I didn't want to do was create an avenue to showcase Rich's voice, because that would be a shit show. That's not, that wouldn't be fun for me, and I don't think it would make for a good record, because that's not the kind of singer I am. I'm a, I'm a guy who sings in a band. That is, that is the sound I like, and that is the sound we're trying to achieve. And that's the tone of creating the, the sound for Jersey Junior. It's the Junior and the Volunteers. It's an ensemble thing. And, and so we're just having a great time. But truly, we were in the studio three days last week, and had a pedal steel player and a banjo player and we had a fiddle player and we got the we got we pulled out all the stops because it's all the stuff I like. Like if I'm gonna do a record with music that I like, it's gonna sound the way I want it to sound. And Jason and I are on the same page about that, so we're pulling out all the stops and making it, you know, putting a, 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 as strong a musical stamp on it as we can to have it be a fun record. Our goal being People who are going to buy it anyway will love it, and people who didn't know they were going to love it will be pleasantly surprised. You know, people who will actually hear it and go, oh, holy crap, this doesn't suck. You know, and the, that, hopefully that'll be one of our first reviews. Shockingly not shitty was the, uh, this, this reviewer found it. Um, so that's, you know, that's what's going on. I, I don't really get too deep in the song list, but, you know, we're, we're calling the, the, the genre drunk country. Because, not that we're drunk while we're doing it, but it just, you know, I love Steve Earle, I love Sturgill Simpson, I love George Jones, I like the old school stuff that has like a real stank to it, and that's what we're doing. And we're having a good time doing it. Thank you, by the way. And by the way, just a, a slightly musical comment. Last night, we played a Nirvana song. And I gotta say, that was a blast. And we, we decided to do that two hours before the show. We had never played it. Billy and Mike had never heard it. And so we played it to on our phones. We were just dinking around in the green room, killing time, and started going, Mom and Dad would do a show. We're like, because I wasn't going to sing a song that night because my voice is kind of off. And I was like, oh, that's, a, that's just kind of talking. I could make Rob do the high part. I was like, I can do the high part. I'm like, we should do that song. And I thought that turned out pretty fun. That was a good, that was a, I, I, and I, I admire the band's talent and ability to do something spontaneous like that. We dropped one song, threw that one in, and just plowed through it and had a really good time. So I hope, hope, hope you enjoyed that half as much as I did. Um, thank you for your question. And you know, thank you for asking about the album. Uh, I hope you're looking forward to it because I think it's going to be fun. Thank you so much. Here. Hey. Uh, my question is kind of silly, but it's for you and you as Gabriel. Uh, are you Team Captain America or Team Iron Man? And are you Team Jacob or Team Edward? <laughs> what was the second one? Team who? Twilight, Jacob or Team Edward? Who the hell are Jacob and Edward? <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a 50 year old straight man. I don't give a shit about Twilight. Um, I, uh, I don't give a crap about Twilight, uh, so I don't have an answer to that one. But I'll say, uh, what was the other one? Captain America or Iron Man? Iron Man. 
And that's solely because I love Robert Downey Jr., man. I, 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 that is a guy for whom I have unwavering respect. Yeah, he was a star when I was a kid. Truly. Like, my wife was, uh, she, you know, he's so great as Iron Man, and she's not necessarily a film buff, and I, I took her back and showed her Less Than Zero, and like, you know, stuff he was doing where he was just mopping the floor with everybody his age when he was 25. And then he had a run-in with drugs and alcohol, and got himself out of that mess and became a bigger movie star. And I think that's awesome. I think that's a testament to his drive and his focus and a good lesson for everybody that, you know, we're all going to hit potholes, but don't let it make you stop the car. You know, I, I think that's, that's really cool. Um, and in, in terms of the other fellows doing the vampire thing, uh, who are you for? Me? Yeah. Um, Edward, yeah. Edward. Yeah. Because I like Robert Pattinson. So. And what's the difference between Edward and uh, who? Yeah. Werewolf and a vampire. Yeah. Isn't Twilight about vampires? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know the name, but you uh, said you don't know it. I know Twilight. You just said the names five times. <laughs> no, I've never seen a Twilight movie, but uh, I was gonna back your play as like a solidarity, so. Yay wolves! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, rah rah, roar roar wolves! <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, Rich. Hey. Uh, so I want to say first that you are my favorite like character. Gabriel is my favorite character. Awesome. Thank you. Very kind of you. And so I wanted to say, who else, if you had the choice to play, if on Supernatural, if you wanted to play someone else, the, oh, would, would I, would play, I play another you. character? Are you asking? Like if not I... playing as your character, like playing as like Sam Dean. Oh, would I want to be somebody else? Um, oh yeah. I mean, look, I think it'd be fun if there was an episode where you could flip the script and I got to play a different character. It'd be fun if Rob and I were Sam and Dean. You know, just uh, <laughs> get in the car and just like move that seat forward a little bit. That would be good, actually. Shoot, a little booster in the bubble so you can see over the... Got the phone book? Got it. Mm. <laughs> uh, I, you know, in terms of like the, sub, the supporting characters of which I am one, I, I think everybody's perfectly cast. I wouldn't want to step on anybody's toes and, and step into anybody else's role, but I think it'd be fun as heck to have Robbie and me be Sam and Dean for a, for a day. That would be cool. I'll go, I'll go that way. Thank you. Hey. My name's Bryn. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, so my question is, what is your favorite accomplishment? My favorite accomplishment as a as a human being. Yes. Um. Hmm, interesting. I I'm glad I have children. I think that is in, in a career, in anybody's career, in life. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. If you're thinking about having kids, you know what I'm talking about. You think a lot about, ooh, how am I going to work that into my day, my, my life? I'm, I'm so busy as it is, and, and you can be focused, and you can always feel like I will have kids when I get here. I, I, I want to wait to have kids until I achieve this. Yep. I want to wait until I have kids when I achieve this. And I felt like that as a young man. And I'm glad that sometimes the right things happen at the right time, and I ignored those feelings and went ahead and started having a family because I don't have any reason to do anything except for the fact that it helps my family. That's why I'm standing on the stage talking to you on a microphone. Because this is how I think my family. I love having kids. I love having a purpose to things that I do. Acting is a very narcissistic business. And you can get really into yourself. And oh man, I, I, I nailed that audition. Why didn't I get that job? Oh man, I was great. They didn't use my best day. Oh man, I had a bad hair day that day. And all that goes out the window when you have kids because you can't focus on yourself like that. You have to focus on other people. And I think that's healthy. I think it's healthy to direct your energy outward and not inward. And think less about yourself and focus on other people. And how can you make life better for those other people? 
How do you make situations easier for those other people? How can you rectify things you may not be proud of or may not have done well in your own life when you know educating and raising other people? These are ongoing challenges. As you know, for people who are parents, it's like, you know, it's like standing on a log. It's a constant movement to stay standing up. You always having to keep keep thinking and moving and, and adjusting to be sure that you're doing it right. And you fall in the water and you screw up and you mess up. And seeing human beings develop in front of you is a wonderful thing. I think that, and that's not even an accomplishment. I, I, I gotta attribute my wife to being really the better of the parent. But I, I, but I do my best to be, to do my half or my, my quarter. I think she does most of the heavy lifting. But I truly love that experience and I love having children to go home to. And I love having children. Uh, uh, I had an interesting conversation last night. I have a son with me here. I have three sons. I don't talk a lot about my private life because my sons didn't pick a public profession. I did. So I don't think it's my job to make them public people. Um, so I keep them out of the way. Um, but I will say, and that's just a choice, I know everybody has their own thing, it's not, I say that not, without judgment. Um, but I had an interesting conversation with my middle son who's running around. If you've seen a blonde boy with glasses in the photo opera room and you're wondering, why is that kid in here? That's my son. Um, and he's, after the concert, my, he had never seen the concert. And he was running around doing other stuff. I mean, his idea of seeing the concert is running around, you know, like playing with the staff and having a good time with the handlers and everybody. But he, after, last night we went to bed, we went to bed and he goes, Dad, you're a very talented man. Aww. And I said, well, thanks, buddy. He's like, you sing really well, you play guitar. Rob thinks you're really funny. I think you're a really talented man. Aww. And I was like, thank you. And I thought that was a neat moment because he sees me only as a dad. He doesn't see, he's never seen Supernatural. He doesn't see things I do. He doesn't know what I do for him. This is all he sees me do. Um, so it was interesting. It was an interesting conversation. A lot, I, I, I diverted from your, from your, your uh, topic. But I will say this. Whatever accomplishments I may have achieved, work or learning to play an instrument, whatever, pale in comparison to opportunities I can provide my children. So if my children grow up to be the people that I hope they will be and think they will be, then I will have done my job and I will feel like that is a tremendous accomplishment. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Okay, so firstly, I had a photo op with you and Rob earlier and I gave him a hug, but I forgot to give you a hug. I'm low-key sad about it. But my question is, how did you become such a meme? Like, did it start with your childhood, or did such you just, a what? A meme. The hell's a meme? Like an <laughs> internet joke? Like, haha, -ha funny joke? How? how wait, how am I? How? I don't mean to be. I'm sorry. I'm, I know I sound like I'm 90, but how am I a meme? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to deride your question. I'm just confused. What? What? How am I a meme? Because of. You? <laughs> Is being a meme a good thing? Mm, depends on the meme, but most of the time. Alright. In this instance, is it a good thing? Yeah. Okay. So, how did I become a meme? Yeah. Well, clearly, I don't know, because I don't know what a meme is. Um, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't know I was a meme. Um, but, uh, uh, I, do, I don't know how that would happen that I would become a meme. I guess I'm on stage a lot and people film it. Is it like a, it's like a gif? The same kind of thing? Like a meme is a repeating thing that happens? Like, crap kid, I don't know. Um, I'm, 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 you threw me a curveball here. I didn't know I was a meme. If it's a good thing, then I'm glad I'm a meme. Because at first I thought you said, how did I become a meme? Which I thought you meant like a, like a crank. And I thought, well, I was born that way, but then now you're going to say a And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what that is, and now you're telling me, I'm still not very clear, so I, I became something funny on the web. Well, I guess I'm on the, t I'm on the stage a lot. Robbie and I are on the stage a lot, doing goofy things, and, and uh, I guess uh, people have captured that on devices that are digital, and uh, uploaded those onto uh, 
onto the World Wide Web and uh, cut them into small little clips and send them around and then people see them and go, well that guy's kind of meme. And, <laughs> and they send it out to their friend, like check out this meme. And then word gets around, next thing you know, 40, 50 people see it. And, uh, and I think that's how it happened. And then, and then we, we led us to this conversation right here where I learned that I am a meme, which could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. Hopefully in this situation, it's a good thing. And I am, I am, I'm proud to say that uh, I'm a good meme. And I hope I never become a bad meme. Although clearly I don't have a lot of control over that because I'm still not sure what the hell it means. But, but, thank you. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I really, I mean, man, there's just some things I just don't understand. Sorry, sorry, that was not a very good answer. I apologize. Oh, yeah, you gotta ask. You ask Al Cal. He's very, he's very young, very internet savvy. How are you? Hi, Rich. Uh, my question is about Band of Brothers. Okay. Um, it's, it's one of the most amazing miniseries. Does a great job from World War II. I'd like to know if you could share maybe one of your fondest experiences or memories from the set of Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers is a great project to be associated with, and that's obviously a stupid thing to say because clearly it's a great so you know, it sounds like duh but it was a great job to get because it was a hard job to get um, and then going over to shoot it was monumental I met some of my closest friends doing that before I had the Supernatural family family I had the Band of Brothers family I had these boys that I went to boot camp with that I worked alongside for nine months in a very intense nine months and it was a you know a big job for all of us um, and it was a great opportunity for all of us to grow as human beings so much about Band of Brothers was special I love that I'm still friends with those guys I love that we have a barbecue every year at Bull's house just to celebrate the beginning of our boot camp we've been doing that every year since we left England um, I, I, I love that that we're all still super close friends I love that it doesn't matter how big Damian Lewis gets, you know, our kids still know each other and we still hang out when he's in town. I, I love that you see somebody who's, I love that Frank John Hughes went to the premiere of Rocket Man because it was directed by band of brother Dexter Fletcher. And Dexter had Frank come to the premiere. I love the friendships that that show created for us. In our own way, it created a, a band not the same because we weren't in war, but not totally dissimilar from the men who, who fought on our behalf. I think the fondest memory, that's not so many fond memories, but I think a fond memory, I tell this story a lot, was how, how we were allowed to do our best for the families we represented and how the production allowed that to happen and encouraged it and facilitated putting those efforts on screen. For example, there's a scene, very brief scene in episode six where Muck is, uh, it's a Doc Rowe episode, right? It's all Doc Rowe, but then Doc Rowe walks past a, a, like an impromptu mass going on, and it's Babe Heffron, Skip Muck, and the priest, and a couple other guys, and Muck says, all right, now if we die, we die in the city of grace. That is, that was not in the script. That is something that Babe Heffron, when he visited us on set, the real Babe Heffron, told us happened. He's like, Skip insisted we have a mass. We were all kneeling in the snow because he knew we were facing great danger. And he said, there, now if we die, we die in a state of grace. The director was like, we're shooting that. And we just set it up and had Doc Rowe walk through the space on his way somewhere and shot that. And it just made something true, another thing true, made it into the story. This, the, there's a scene where I tell the story about Muck swimming across the Niagara River. I talk about my character, I say, I, I swam across the Niagara River and, and, and pissed off my sister and girlfriend doing that. And that was also not in the script. That was in a letter that was written to me by the sister of Skip Mock. Skip obviously died, he never had a wife or, ch or children that I could talk to, but I talked to his sister and his nieces. And his sister sent me this story, wrote me this letter. This is before the internet was as handy as it is now. So she wrote me a physical letter in London telling me the story, and I showed it to the director. The director's like, that's great. We'll sit you in a foxhole and tell the story. And that's a true story. That's really what happened. Skip swam the Niagara River, and his girlfriend, Faye, was annoyed with him. 
and his, and his sister Ruth was in order. And Faye, when the series came out, watched the show, and Faye, who had not spoken to the family since Skip died, saw that, saw her name mentioned, and was so moved that she called the family and returned to the family the original jump wings that Skip had sent her from boot camp. We were able to get to, to uh, lobby the government to reissue all of Skip's medals because they were lost when he died. That was a highlight. There's so many things about that series that are special to me. It affected how I view myself as a person, as a man, and as an American. And not a lot of jobs have that kind of impact. I can't fathom being those men. I can't fathom having... I'm not sure people are made like that anymore. I hope we don't ever have to test it, but I don't know, because it was, it was an extraordinary time for people, you know, people who... Those, those men, the, the first 20 times they ever saw an airplane, they were jumping out of it. This is a different time. And I thought it was, a, it was a remarkable to put yourself in that situation, to learn from those guys, from the veterans, to talk to those people, to see the devotion of Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg trying to tell that story correctly. Just to be a part of the whole thing was, was remarkable. And, I, and I'll tell this little piece of Hollywood trivia along with it that I think is fascinating. I talked about it in a meet and greet that so Skip swims the Niagara River. He's from Tonawanda, New York. Swims across the Niagara River, which is very wide and very fast. So if you get too tired and you're swimming the Niagara River, you're going over Niagara Falls. You're dead, which is why it's dangerous to do. And so this part of the story I didn't know until after the fact. So what, what I said in the, in the miniseries about him swimming is what I knew to be the truth. What also happened, the other detail that I did not know, is that when he swam across the Niagara River, they were, his buddies were worried that he was going to get too tired, so they had somebody in a rowboat rowing, rowing alongside him to be sure that if he got too tired, he could grab another boat. The person rowing that boat was a man, kid, in Fritz Nyland, which may not mean anything to you, except for it will mean something to you when you will when you hear what name they used for him when they made a movie about his life. Private Ryan. That was the fifth Ryan brother. The Nyland, the five Nyland brothers are the brothers on which the movie Private Ryan is based. So Skip Muck swam across the river with Private Ryan rowing alongside him. Which is substantial to me because you think about this tiny little town. Like any town in America, it was affected by the war. And this tiny little town has two people that were then turned into, you know, Hollywood's, you know, soldiers sort of immortalized in the Hollywood lens. And I find that rare and fascinating. They actually built a memorial to those two guys and all veterans on the bank of that river where they shoved off uh, years later. And I think that's a, a fitting tribute, kind of a, just a rare, crazy Hollywood moment for those two guys would be in the same time, the same town, same time, same experience, and then both end up in movies about the war experiences. Crazy. Anyway, I, could, I, I literally I could talk to you about this all day, but I won't. But thank you for your question. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Clearly, I have a lot to talk about with our family brother. Here. Uh, hi. Um, so we know that you're uh, directing three episodes of Supernatural next mm -hmm. season. So I was just... Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you know what number of episodes you have. Uh, I, as of now, it could change. It probably won't change, but as of now, I'm doing... Uh, seven, twelve, and I'm not sure which the third one's going to be. It's going to be in the latter half of the season, towards the towards the back. So something in the teens. But um, well, that makes sense because after twelve, it becomes the teens. <laughs> but um, yeah, later. Um, but I'm doing that. I'm doing twelve. Uh, at number seven, we're doing number seven of Supernatural. Um, then I'll come back here, no, go back to Los Angeles, and I'll do number seven of Lucifer. I'm driving Lucifer. And then I'll go back and do number 12 for Supernatural. So that's that's my fault. That, those are the ones you can look for with my name. Thank you. Hey. Hi. Um, 
My sister couldn't be here and she's rather mad at me and my best friend. She actually flipped us off on video chat when she figured out we could we were coming here and you're her favorite, so I thought maybe to make up for it I should probably ask you a question. Sure. Um, what was uh, what was one of your uh, funniest experiences on set or like um, as you were uh, uh, like doing some of the episodes as an actor, what was the funniest thing you saw happen to Misha? <laughs> what do you think I saw happen to Misha? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hate to disappoint you, I'm not sure I saw anything funny happen to Misha. Um, the orange underwear! I didn't see him in the underwear underwear. That, I didn't know Misha was involved in that debacle until it way too late. The one Misha story that Misha likes to tell, and this is not me acting as Craig, I don't think I, I really worked with Misha as an actor so much. So I, I think most of my stuff was with the guys, so it'll, it'll, this will have to be a directing story, but there's a scene in Stuck in the Middle with You where Castiel gets tossed out a window and then is crawling away and Ramiel's stalking him with a spear and then a truck pulls up and he's rescued and all that. And um, I told Misha, I said, listen Misha, there's no way I would never put you in harm's way. We're going to have you crawling, we're going to put a green screen behind you, we'll, we'll uh, composite them. The, uh, the truck in later, we'll shoot the truck separately, we'll marry them together. I'm simply we're going to do these in place and not going to have you anywhere near that truck. That was the beginning of the day. As the hours waned and things got hairy, I said, I got out there on the right music. I need you laying belly down in the mud, and I want you to crawl forward and make it snappy because the truck's going to be right freaking there. And if you slow, so much to so slow down, you're going to be hobbling home because the truck is coming. And, and it's not totally true. There was enough distance, but I literally, he's like, you said you weren't going to have the truck and me at the same time. I'm like, I did say that. You're right. I lied. I need you on the street <laughs> crawling in the mud, and the truck will pull safely behind you. And. Uh, I, I think somewhere they used some outtakes of him crawling in the mud in one of the blooper reels because he started to get out. I was like, faster! I was yelling direction at him. Groan, you're in pain! And then he's like, ah, ah, screw you! Like, he got tired of wallowing in the mud. But, I, but that'll have to satisfy as my, as my funny Misha story. So, there you go. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I want to ask, what's the most interesting, like, art or object you've seen of you or your character? Oh gosh, you know, I, I did, I'm blessed with a lot of, we all in this supernatural family are blessed with some really great artists in this, in, amongst you. There's some really beautiful art, um, that has, I've seen online or I've seen, uh, in, in, up close, um, there have been some, you know, Beautiful paintings, digital art, sculptures, pop art. People I've seen Gabriel made out of rubber bands. I've been woven, uh, turned into a pillow. Uh, it's it's all very impressive to me. I, I would be loath to pick a favorite because I, I don't have a favorite. I'm always impressed that people take a, take time to spend their art on something that I have a hand in. And I know it's more inspired by the character itself than than me, but I, you know, the writers, the directors, the creators, and I have come together to create a character that connects with people sometimes. And when those people then are inspired to write a story, write a song, write a poem, paint, uh, sew, or mold a figure that has been inspired by that performance or by that episode, I think that's fantastic. So I, I'm, I am deeply impressed by everything that crosses my path, be it digitally or in person. I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed, I'm always moved by it, and I think it's awesome. And I think it's great because art is so important and it's so great to have an outlet. And if this, if, if this show or any show inspires that kind of reaction out of people and they then go and do something creative and use that part of their brain and their hands and their body and their intelligence and their heart, that's wonderful. So I won't pick a favorite because I like it all. I think it's all awesome and all impressive. And I, you know, people ask sometimes about fan fiction. They go, ah, what do you think about fan fiction? And I think about fan fiction, what I think about 
any fiction on any shelf anywhere. Good for you. Good for you for writing stories. For, for using your mind and using your brain and following your heart and telling your story in whatever way you want to tell it. I think it's awesome. I think it's great things that the show inspires people to do those kinds of creative things, to create thoughts and memories for themselves that they sometimes share with us. So I, I feel nothing but appreciation to be a part of that process. Thank you. Hello. Um, if you could meet any character from Supernatural in real life, who would it be and why? If I could meet any actual character. God. <laughs> to prove that there is one. That would be neat. And I go, aha! I knew it! Um, that, to me, that would be the most fascinating character to me. Because obviously, he's a kind of a big, he or she, they, is kind of a big deal. So, that would be, um, you know, we, we all have this imagination of what we think that would look like, but to, to actually, if it were a real thing, or we're talking about a real situation, that'd be kind of crazy. So, I'll go with God. What about you? Do you have somebody you would meet? Probably Charlie. Yeah. I get that. You know, I really, I loved getting to work with Felicia. That was super cool, because I got to direct her in an episode, and I've always been a fan of hers. Uh, not just because I think she's great on the show and great at what she does, but she's also just, uh, I mean, I think she's a force of nature. I think she's just a, a she's cutting edge talent who was doing edgy, cool things, uh, before anybody else. She's a pioneer of sorts, if you will. Uh, and I admire the hell of what she's done with her career and her life and how she handles everything around her and her success and her passion and her, and her arts and, uh, and her business. She's just incredibly savvy and funny as heck and it was a real treat to get to direct her and work with her finally and I was intimidated by it. Very intimidated by it. And I think she's so cool. And we ended up having a really good time, so I think that's a good choice. I salute your choice. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Um, really quick, I just want to thank you for your patrol game. It looks really moving to me, and it's why I'm uh, pursuing the career that I am. Um, Great. So my question is, you mentioned Lucifer earlier. Um, I want to know what it was like directing an episode of that show, and if you have any fun stories from set. Uh, I, I loved directing Lucifer. Uh, it was, you know, it was a big deal because I was directing something other than Supernatural, and I've been where I'd been directing many episodes. And at some point, I needed to leave the nest and direct other shows, and I was really uh, thrilled to get a chance to do Lucifer because I already liked the show, I already loved the showrunners, and I already loved Tom Ellis. And, and, uh, I had met him, thought he was just a class act from stem to stern. Thought Ildi and Joe, the showrunners, were fantastic people, helming a great show. I thought it had elements that that fit uh, my skill set, and that it leaned into the drama, but also played in the comedy space and does a lot of fun character stuff. So I, I just loved it. Uh, it was very intimidating to go there because, yeah, it was intimidating to start at Supernatural, but at least I knew them. I didn't know anybody at Lucifer. I didn't know any crew people. I didn't know. I mean, I knew Tom, but I wouldn't see Tom until we were shooting. This is prep, where I don't know the producers, I don't know the department heads, and, and I found that very, very intimidating. I also found it awesome. I thought they were, uh, ended up being lovely people, uh, who were, couldn't have been nicer and, and better at what they do. They were just all awesome. Um, <laughs> I think we had a lot of, you know, any giant laughs on set. I, I don't necessarily recall anything hilarious happening, but it was certainly a fun experience. You know, I, I, I get the question a lot, what's the difference between directing Lucifer? What, what were the, some of the differences between doing Lucifer and Supernatural? One of the differences is uh, Lucifer, uh, they, they don't care that I'm there. They just want me to do a good job. I'm not friends with them, you know, and so it was, it was just showing up to a place where they expected me to do my job and to do it well, and there was no, like, you got this kid because I'm no longer a freshman. They just wanted me to show up and do my job. Whereas in Supernatural, I had sort of been coddled along the way because I knew them and they were very supportive of my uh, transition into that career. What's the same is how professional and focused and dialed in 
the leads of the shows are. Um, you you can't you can say what you want to say about the writing on Supernatural when you've liked it, when you haven't liked it. What season you like, what season you don't like, what episodes you like, what episodes you don't like. About the directing, about the the, the characters, the big bads, who they kill, who they don't kill. You can say all these things, you can have this debate for the last 14, going on 15 seasons. But the reason why that show is on the air and would continue to be on the air ad infinitum if so decided is because of Jared Jensen. Because those gentlemen are, they check every box. They are incredibly talented men. They are incredibly kind men. They are kind to each other. They are kind to their crew. They are kind to the fandom because they care. They care about each other. They care about their crew. They care about the show. They care about the characters. And that permeates every decision they make surrounding that show. And that's why that show is as good as it is and why it's lasted as long. You, they're irreplaceable. Their energy and their spirit and their talent drive the show. Fact. Not debatable. Um, and, you know, I, I can tell you that, you know, obviously we're friends, so I'm biased, but I can also tell you that as a guy who directs the show now, and I show up on set and I've cast, you know, a young man to play a clerk in a scene, he's gonna work one day and he's nervous. The first thing Jerry and Jensen do when they walk on set, they go to the new guy and go, hey, I'm Jerry Padalecki, I'm Jensen Ackles, how are you? Welcome to the show. What's your name? Awesome, man. You know, we're gonna have some fun today. Make the guys, the girls, and the new people feel right at ease. They're, that is rare. It's sad, but most actors are kind of assholes. And Jerry and Jensen are not, and it didn't matter how far up the food chain they have gotten. They have stayed the same. Which is an homage, by the way, really, to Mr. and Mrs. Ackles and Mr. and Mrs. Badalecki, who did a great job. So, thank you, Texas. You turned out two good ones. Um, and Tom Ellis is cut from the same cloth. Tom Ellis and Lauren, but I work more with Tom, is the exact same. He is full of light and life and energy and joy and and understands the gift he's been given to be the lead of the show and is excited to spread that joy to everyone he meets. He's incredibly kind, incredibly prepared, uh, incredibly uh, energetic and easy to work with and committed. And so it made, once we got into production, and of course he's the, he's Lucifer and Lucifer, so his tone permeates the whole vibe and it really makes it a pleasant place to go to work. So in, in, in that regard, those shows have that similarity. They're blessed with really gifted leads who really care about the show and the actors and the crew and the content of the, of the, of the piece itself. So it's really awesome. Thank you, by the way. Hello there. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm excellent. Thank you, how are you? Good. Good. Uh, so way back when, when you were first the trickster, did you know or even have an inkling of what your character would become, because I, to me, that reveal was huge, and it oh, completely yeah. changed how I viewed the show and everything. So, no, I had no idea, and I'm going to go on a limb and say the writers had no idea. I don't think, I don't think when I came in to do the one episode as the trickster, they knew that they would then take that and make that character part of a bigger mythology. I could be wrong. I guess that at the end of the day is a Kripke, only Kripke knows, you know, type thing, but. I, I really don't think they did because it was built as a one-off. Of course, they, they could have kept it dangling, but they kept characters dangling before and not brought them back. So I feel like I feel like I got lucky that they found a great use for that character to work him into the mythology of the show in a bigger way. Um, and yeah, that's a huge deal. I mean, to go from doing a one-off to being, or then doing a second episode, but then suddenly you're really part of the big picture of the show the big art, and it's awesome. It totally changes the character's value in the universe, so to speak. So, um, I don't think they knew. I'm glad they made that decision on the fly, though, because I don't think I'd be standing here talking to you if, I, if they hadn't. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, sorry, my question's a little unoriginal. I asked Rob, and he liked it, so I hope you like it. Okay. Um, if you had $100 million to make perfect movie, what would the plot look like? 
I wouldn't spend a hundred million dollars on a movie. If I personally had a hundred million dollars, I don't know, I would probably, what could I live on? I think I would give away 90 million and go live peacefully with my family on an island somewhere. I'd get out of the business. Um, and so I, 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 so I don't know how to answer that because that's uh, a bit of a trick question. I don't know what the plot would be. I went to Mars. If I was going to be, what do you say? I, sh I have a movie. What was your movie? Oh man, it's a great film. He said he asked you the same question, right? Yeah, yeah. I, um, it's a movie about I'm an astronaut. I go to Mars. Yeah. And then I come back, and all this time has passed. It's one of those kind of things yeah. where like time moves differently on Mars than here. Oh, like Planet of the Apes? Yeah. Maybe. Then I, I, when I come back, my kid is full grown and he's my age. Right? Yeah. You still with me? Yeah. And we both join the police, police force and we take down the drug cartel. Alright. Good. So... Is there a space force? Are you in drug? You got a hundred million to spend. You got no, the space force is just, just kind of act one of the movie. Okay. And that's the best. It's a buddy cop movie with me and my son. Alright. Who's my age. I'll produce that. <laughs> I'm going to take one last question here, boys, and then we're going to we'll sign off. You're right there. Um, I was wondering, what was your favorite role to portray? The trickster, Gabriel, or Loki? Oh, gosh. I don't know if you can separate the three of them. But, I mean, I, here's the thing. I guess, if, if push came to show, I would have to say Gabriel. Because I really, I, I'm closest to that character. I've spent the most time with that character. And that character's had the, the most to do out of, out of those three sort of versions of that character. But I really loved playing Loki. I thought that was really fun. I'm thrilled they gave me the opportunity to play and find that real character. And then to have those two characters do a standoff against each other was just a rare gift that you don't get in television as a guest star. You rarely get a decent role, period. But you get a great role and a great role have them be in the same episode, have them face off in the same episode, and be the guy directing that, that never happens. There are very few people who can say that they've directed themselves kicking their own ass. I'm one of the few people who can say that, and I'm proud to be able to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that that man is standing here and that man is standing here tells me one thing, and that is it is the end of our time on the stage with you. I know. We're as pained as you are, but... It has been such a home run. This whole weekend has been an outstanding, outstanding weekend. So I want you to join with us and sing the song we sing to celebrate the end of the weekend. If you know the words, sing it. If you don't listen, you'll figure it out quickly. And you will join in with us as we sing. It's the end of the con as we know it. It's the end of the con. Don't leave just yet. It's the end of the con as we know it. It's the end of the con as we know it. It's the end of the con as we know it. So go. On behalf of Mr. Stephen Norton. On behalf of Mr. Brian, Mr. Rob Benedict. I'm Richard Stokes. Thank you so much, guys! There you go, it's been awesome! We'll see you next time! Thanks, everybody! See you next time!